Well, we're going to uh, get started today, so welcome to those who are online. Jacob, uh, I, what is it, 100, 200, or what do we have online? Quite a few. Excellent. Um, all right, I'm Mike, and we're in a series of... Um, that is, uh, let's go to, um, one moment, hold on, sorry, sorry. I am, oh, I need to get to the beginning here of these slides. Okay, we're in a series about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus and we're looking at what the life and teachings of Jesus are and we're looking at the scriptures and at the text and asking this question about what does a follower of Jesus mean and, and what are some of the things that are common that we can pull out so let's go to slide one We've covered that a follower of Jesus is a person of God's word and a prayer, love, and unity. And today we're going to look at a person committed to discipling others. And what does that really mean to disciple others? And so today we're going to look at, uh, on slide two, it's what Jesus said and what Jesus did and what he taught. And so for those who have been a part of a community that is associated with the modern Christian views, we've heard this phrase called the Great Commission. And the issue really is, are we, in essence, as a follower of Jesus, discipling others or sharing the gospel? Or what does that really look like? So in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, that is, that text is what's called the Great Commission. Now, Matthew, as we've talked about, was a Jewish uh, person, a Jewish writer. He's, he, he's writing to a Judy, Jewish audience. And so the traditions of the Jewish faith, faith extend from, of course, the Hebrews, extending on down from Abraham. And so they understood this idea of disciple because uh, in their language it was called ta uh, taladim. It was, in essence, um, those who were committed to learning the teachings of their rabbi. And when the Jewish people came back from exile in Babylon, and we won't go into what happened, but in essence, they came back and, and there became a series of prophets and who encouraged them, but ultimately they had these period of time where a method of teaching around the synagogue was developed in Judah, or in essence, um, what we now know as Israel. But the teachings of uh, the Torah, the first five books of, of uh, the Bible and the, and the prophets and the writings and all of that were done inside these series of buildings called synagogues. And the temple had been uh, destroyed and then it was re rebuilt, and it was in Jerusalem, and it was in sort of a, what they call the phase that was known for Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, or anyway. And then later on, Herod made it a lot better. But what they realized is, they, or what they, they believed at that time is, the reason we went into exile be, is because we rebelled against God. And one of the reasons that we rebelled and one of the reasons that we had, um, we got lost was we didn't know the text. We didn't teach our children 
the writings of Moses, in essence, the Torah. Our, our children lost track of the story of who we are as a people and who God is. And we're not going to let that happen again. So we're going to be people of the text even more so than we were before. And so we're going to establish these places of gathering where you learn about the text, the sacred writings, the scriptures. And they used to meet, and in the center of it was this uh, place where they, uh, they called the Seat of Moses, and it was the teacher. And you would, they had this sort of place where you would read and the teaching would go forth. It was called Bema, the Bema. And so there was an emphasis in the Jewish community at that time. And this predated the birth of Jesus by a couple hundred years. And, but synagogue-based teaching. And there were rabbis who became authority on the teachings of the prophets and the text. And they would take disciples. And these disciples would become very learned in the text. And, and back then in the synagogues, they created this system where boys and girls would begin to learn the text. And we had, uh, so the, the rabbi in that area, the, he, the head rabbi in an area around a synagogue, and these children come in, I think they were around five or six, and he would start off and they would begin to learn what we would refer to as, of course, Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created, you know, the heavens. In, in the beginning, God created, in essence. God created the heavens and the earth. And then the rabbi would put honey on his finger and he would put it, they'd stick out their tongue and, and when they recited, they could learn that first verse, he would put honey on their tongue. And he would say, you know, the, in essence, the, the word of God, the Torah, the sacred text is like honey on your lips. And, of course, it was referring to sections of Ezekiel and, I, and others that referred to that. But the training of the children was designed to make them already understand that the text, the word of God, the, the, the teachings of this community that explain to us what God is, who God is, and who we are, and what our mission is, that it was... It was uh, a wonderful process. And of course, back then, they didn't have M&Ms, right? So that honey was really good. And so, um, and then they would learn the Torah, first five books. They would not just learn them, they would recite them. They would memorize them. And then at a certain age, they would go to just the boys. And not all the boys, the boys who showed they had a proficiency to learn. So that a, one of the rabbis teaching in the synagogue could say, you know, when Moses encountered the Lord in the image of the three, on his way to Sodom, Moses was so, and then, you know, and he'd trail off, right? And then the child would say, generous. He invited them in and asked Sarah to make bread. And he said, please dine here, fetch water, fetch bread. In the essence, Abraham, I should say, Abraham was, was generous. And, you know, so they would interact with him and make sure they were learning. And then, you know, they would begin to learn about other things like the Psalms and the Book of Wisdom, the wisdom books, the tools by which we have in the Holy Text to teach us about, you know, like Proverbs, you know, generally true sayings that Psalms, the worship. And then the boys that showed a capacity to memorize that. Can you imagine memorizing that? memorizing it 
being able to recite it and engage with the rabbi, then those guys, the best of the best, would move on to become disciples of the rabbi. And then so rabbi would say, you know, follow me and come. And then the, those uh, boys who didn't uh, get selected would be encouraged to, you know, go into their father's trade, be fishermen, carpenters. But they still, by that time, can you imagine even if, if you were like, say, Peter or John, and you didn't make the cut, and you were in your dad's trade, but by that time, you had already memorized the Torah. You had understood the writings, the prophet Isaiah, and how different parts of Isaiah all of this goes into this Jewish culture and this concept of disciple. And understanding in this area, you know, they, they met in these synagogues and they would pray. They would, there would be worship. There would be singing. There'd be teaching. You begin to go, gosh, you know, that, that sounds familiar to the early followers of Jesus, doesn't it? In fact, it almost sounds like a congregation um, so this idea of disciple in the Jewish community was very rich and very powerful and people understood it so when Jesus after he resurrected so we know the story I'm not going to go into it but he was executed and um, he we don't know necessarily how it looked like it was just boom he was alive and he said to his disciples and let's go to slide three so this is the great commission now i wanted you to have all that background because we're going to talk about the great commission but understand these words great commission of course he never used that's a phrase to describe something but we're going to look actually at the text and we're going to look at it in the context of disciples in that first century Judea. Verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority, and he's talking to his disciples and others who were there, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe observe all that i have commanded you and behold i am with you always to the end of the age now that's the english standard version the next slide we're going to look at the message version this is a different translation where it's perhaps a little bit easier to understand some of the things it says jesus undeterred went right ahead and gave his charge god authorized and commanded me to commission you, go out and train everyone you meet far and near in, the way of, in, in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this day after day, after day, right up to the end of the age. So let's look at slide five. Now, if you break this down, Jesus in this phrase says to them, let's look at uh, slide five. He's, this is the reason Jesus is king. And he says, all authority. Now, what's he sound like? He almost sounds like Caesar. In essence, he's saying, I am a king. All authority. And he has the authority of a king. And our king has a government. He has a kingdom, the kingdom of God. And we see at this moment in history two, in essence, kingdoms. Two dominant, well, one's dominant, Rome. In essence, this idea of empire, this kingdoms of humanity, 
which has as its enforcement theme fear. And then we have this kingdom of God, which has as its enforcement theme love. And this sets up this two types of movements. And the one is the kingdom of God where Jesus said clearly, and it's been written by Paul and others, but I'm the king. He is the Hamashiach, the Messiah. And he said, the kingdom is here. Now, Jesus, in the context of this, when he says, go out and make disciples of all nations, he's talking to people who understood what disciples were. In the essence, he was saying, okay, here's my strategy for winning. Just like back in the synagogues, the strategy to make sure we bring in here and the children, right? Here's the strategy of this king. Go. Make disciples. Let's go to slide six. So Jesus is saying, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Go out and train. This is the message. Go out and train. Here's his strategy of this king. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in the way of life. Go, therefore. And then the context, again, we're looking at it 2,000 years later, different culture, different language. Sometimes it's hard to get, but it, it's some, I think the English better embraces the original meaning to say, as you go, as you're going, make disciples. The message says, train others in this way of life. All nations, people groups, everyone you meet far and near as well. You start to see that the theme, if you look at verse 7, or let's look at slide 7. We're going to go back. A disciple is a formal relationship with the rabbi, but also one can see it as, are you investing in someone? In essence, your time, your thoughts, your experience. And you look at what Jesus did because, yes, he had disciples. He also allowed all these others to be around him as well. He invested his time. He invested his relationships. He taught. There was formal relationships and some less formal. And some he related to as they were together. In the scriptures, it says Jesus was with them. With. You know, on the, when they would go from one place to another, and, you know, it may be one verse or one sentence as we read it, it could have been a week of walking and sitting and resting and having a meal for them. There's a lot of relationship that happens when you operate like that. Let's look at slide eight. So what are these nations referred to in the Great Commission? The Greek, it was, uh, uh, again, this was translated, originally written, written in my view. I, I think it was written in Hebrew, and then it was translated into Greek. But ethnos was the word in the Greek. And it means, in essence, a race as of the same habit. In other words, a tribe, a, uh, typically implicating someone other than us, and in the Jewish context, meaning a Gentile or a pagan nation. Ethnos is translated, you see it other ways as uh, meaning Gentiles 93 times, nation 64 times, heathen people. It, in essence, it means people groups, tribes. So as you go, you're investing in people. Sometimes you're investing in a formal way. Sometimes you're investing in a less formal way. Slide nine. As we live, we invest in others. That's really what it means, I think, to us, perhaps, initially, when we think about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, is that we invest in others. We encourage them toward Jesus in this, quote, way of life, end quote, meaning the kingdom of God. What does that look like? 
teaching them. That was the other part of this great commission. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you is what Jesus, well, what did he command? In essence, the life and teachings of Jesus. He is a king and he has a kingdom. We need to know the text. So, slide 10. Now, some people choose to take trips and use a formal approach as they invest in others and talk about Jesus and his teaching. Some people say, hey, I'm going to travel to Guatemala. Or I know people who uh, have uh, invested in an orphanage in Guatemala. And uh, they put their time, and then they go down there, put the resources. And when they're there, they are there. And when they're home here, they do everything from uh, internet provider service or data center and a teacher at a school. That's a husband and wife, what they do. But when they're there, they, um, they talk about Jesus a lot. It's a formal context of like, hey, we're here and we're going to. And so they put themselves in this context of Guatemala and they're talking to the people. And so they're not talking about, you know, data storage. They're talking about Jesus and they're talking about the message that this king has, the gospel, the guion, which is the word meaning that anytime there's a new emperor, this is what Rome did. They would have a guion, in essence, to say, there's the message, the good news. There's a new emperor, and he would give away things and stuff. Well, Jesus describing himself and Paul describing Jesus did it to say, just like the emperor, Jesus, there's a gospel of the kingdom. We have a new king, and he has a kingdom. And so it's, it's setting up these competing kingdoms and competing allegiance to the emperor or to Jesus. And so that's where they got that word gospel and guion. So the Great Commission is a call to invest in others as we live our lives. To help them see that there is a kingdom of God that is here. And our king is for us. And our king is kind. And our king is merciful. So discipling others. The interesting thing is investing in others. Is that a strategy that can work? If you were going to set a strategy and say, look, the most powerful ruling authority on the earth is Rome and they are brutal. And your thought is, you know what? I'm setting up a competition between my kingdom and that kingdom. Their strategy is armies and occupation forces, massive taxation, brutalization, but in essence, the worship of Caesar. My strategy is people like you. Jesus, when I say my, in other words, Jesus is in essence saying, yeah, the kingdom of God has a strategy. And we now refer to it thousands of years later and we call it the Great Commission. Now, through this, at least our time here, we put ourselves back in the context and we realize he's talking to people who understood that there is a strategy and to understand the text and to invest in children and to invest into each other. And so Jesus is saying, my strategy is you being together. And as you go, you're discipling, you're investing in people. You're letting them know that you have an allegiance to a different king. You have a different way about you. Some people in Caesar's kingdom get offended. How dare you disrespect me? The way of Jesus' kingdom is 
We don't hold grudges. We keep no record of long, wrong. You know, we show kindness. I mean, when you sit back and think of it, if we had to come up and say, what's a strategy that works? I'm not sure any of us would, in all honesty, vote for that strategy. Because it flies in the face of what human experience has shown. Might makes right. But we know this, that Rome is gone and the kingdom of God is here. The Great Commission is a strategy. Let's look at slide 11. In the face of a Roman Empire, can a simple strategy of investing in others and helping them learn about the life and teachings of Jesus really work? Can the kingdom of God become more and more visible to a broken world as we go? Takan olam is a Hebrew word. It's a theme. And to that Jewish audience he was talking to, they understood it. They learned about it. They memorized it. And they understood that when, since they were young, they said, don't you see, we Hebrew people, we repair the world. They know from the book of Isaiah, it says, we are the repairers of the breach. There were stores of the broken. Jesus said, in fact, when he came, he sat down in the seat of Moses and, or, you know, it sat down in, at the Bema and he read this thing and it says, I've come to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. And he said, you know, this is fulfilled right in your midst. He has a strategy. A follower of Jesus really understands, begins to say, ah, oh, my rabbi, Jesus, Yeshua, has a strategy. And it doesn't look like it'll work, except it's kind of work. And the way of the kingdom is to kan olam, repairs the world. The world's broken, and the kingdom of God repairs it. So this is why I'd go to slide 12 as we go into discussions for a good chunk of time. Does this strategy work? Think about yourself. Who invested in you? Who invested their time and experience, their thoughts into you? And it doesn't matter if you're 18 or 81. If you breathe air, you're still here and you still have a purpose and you are still worth investing in. So who's invested in you and did that make an impact on you? Did that investment? And then second of all, when you invested in others, how did it go for them? And did you receive a benefit from investing in others in this sort of way, sharing your thoughts, sharing your experience, sharing your time? Is this a strategy that you've encountered in your life and has, and how has that impacted you? That's our table discussion. You, of course, have a big crowd with you. You may have to slide over or something, but, or grab those folks back there. Yeah, all right. Well, table talk. All right, we're going to wrap this up. I hope that was a good table discussion about who invested in you and, and how that worked. Some of us have had formal relationships where we were invested in, some of us informal. And in turn, we've invested in people formal, formally and, or informally. You know, when I look at people who do that well, some of the folks I, 
I think about in our own culture who does that well. And, you know, I've encountered some of the, uh, my friends who, uh, you know, I became friends with them, I should say, that uh, were in a monastery. And the, some of the things that really attracted me to their experience was that they had, they were being discipled every day. They were with the brother, you know, an older priest, you know, they wore the gown, they were up early praying the Psalms. I mean, they just, they lived this life almost of a rabbi and some disciples. And then you look at some of the other examples and some of them aren't necessarily related to the church. Some examples are, for an example, uh, you know, I've seen great discipleship in the, um, some of the trade, construction trade unions. Um, and, you know, years ago when I was serving in elective office, I won't say the word politics because I know that's, but I was in politics. And so one of the things that I did is I, um, I met with unions and I was, uh, I, was, I, I was and still remain pretty pro union, private unions, trade unions, you know, folks that swing a hammer for a living, wire, commercial and buildings like the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and a lot of, I mean, those folks are wonderful. And they have an apprenticeship program. And when you really see what they do and how they develop you along, it's kind of like discipleship. Then I think about the military. Now, I'm just talking about my own experiences, but I'm still in the military. I'm, I'm a reserve in the, the Air National Guard. But they have very formal programs to bring you along and teach you leaders, your appointed people. You know, and So when does it become a rabbi, d disciple? What does it mean for us and to say to our king, our rabbi, this Jesus to say, look, I'm going to, as I go, wherever I find myself, invest, I'm going to invest in others. I'm going to try to invest in a few formally. I'm going to try to invest in maybe even more informally. But I'm going to train them up. I, let's look at slide uh, 13. You know, this is, what we, this is how we ended it last week. History shows that the unity of a few people can change nations. Unity with the Holy Spirit changes the world that you're engaged with. Jesus modeled unity with a few. Jesus also modeled what it looks like to be in unity with the Holy Spirit. A follower of Jesus is a person of unity. That's how we ended it a couple weeks ago. And the next slide I'd say is this. I'd say just add one more. G followers of Jesus together invest in others as they go. Because when we're in unity and we're out moving, wherever we are, we're investing in others. It exposes others to the life, to the teachings of Jesus and to the way of the kingdom of God. This is the strategy of our rabbi. This is the strategy of Jesus. One could argue it works. And if you look at history as this strategy has been deployed, it's worked. Whether it's been in a context of the India Freedom Movement or other, it's worked. In fact, being in unity moving forward, investing in others, discipling others, educating children. It says in the Torah in Genesis, and I believe it's in um, Genesis, uh, could be maybe 17, 18, but 
the image of God appearing to Moses. And it's three. And Moses has this hospitality where he has Sarah make bread and the servants get water and he stays there and et cetera. And he's generous. And then this other says, should we tell Moses what we're going or should we tell Abraham what we're going to do for he shall be a great nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. What's that sound like? Oh, the covenant of Abraham where all nations are blessed. And then it says, for he shall teach his children. Later on, Joshua, when he came into the promised land, the book of Joshua, I believe it's in chapter four. If you look at the end of that chapter, they're in the promised land and they bring out rocks. And Joshua says, set up rocks, each tribe. And they built this rock monument. He says, this is so that the children... We're going to teach our children, but that the children will ask us generations from now, what is this? And we shall tell them God had us cross the Jordan on dry land. We want to be people that invest in others. A follower of Jesus invests in others, teaches them about our king. In his ways. And where we came from. And who we are. And we do it in such a way. That people ask. What is this? This is the tradition and the heritage. That we've seen from the beginning. And if you look in the scriptures. All down to this moment. When Jesus said. As we now call the great commission. I think of it as the great strategy of success. This is how we win. This is how he wins. This is how the kingdom of God advances. Previously, if you go to the YouTube channel, there are sermons called Share a Meal, another sermon called Share Your Friends, another one called Share Your Story. Okay, spoiler alert, it's me. And I was giving a sermon. I gave a, you know, a three, a, you know, sermon in three parts. It just happened to be months in between. Because ultimately, how do we do this? How do we invest in others? Share a meal. Start there. It's a very intimate thing, you know, to us Hebrews. Us. Descend from Abraham. It's a wonderful, intimate thing to share a meal and to show hospitality. And then you can share your friends with them. Hey, you know, you should meet so-and-so in this or, you know, hey, I'm I'm involved in this. And you share your friends. Then you share your story. This is this is my life. You share your story. And it moves and moves this investment is a great strategy so this as we see in our slide is how a follower of jesus disciples and nations it begins with just sharing a meal investing in someone but i love the concept of discipleship i think that is how generations are changed and nations are changed people in unity and discipleship happening naturally and formally and continually and wouldn't it be wonderful if our children and our grandchildren had an opportunity to be discipled by godly men and women who had a passion for our king and were free to share their story. Wouldn't that be something you'd love to see? Well, the good news is, let's pray for that. 
And while we're praying for that, let's begin with a neighbor, with a colleague, with each other. Little steps. Next week, slide 15, November 14th, is a follower of Jesus is a person who bears fruit. So we're going to talk about that. Well, normally we go into a song, and so therefore I've decided to share with you a song tonight. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm tongue deaf. I, I can't sing worth a lick. My daughter can sing. My wife can sing. I cannot sing. Can anyone here sing? Okay, so let's do this. I'll just pray and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll end it. Any, first of all, before we go, is there any thoughts or questions anyone would love to uh, share for the good of the order? That's what you say at Qantas Club, right, before you shut it down. Is there anything for the good of the order? Anybody? Okay, well then, let's pray. Father Yahweh, we thank you, and we pray that you would let our children and our grandchildren have people who can disciple them in the life and teachings of Jesus. And I pray that you would give that to our families and that you would give us an opportunity both to be invested in and to invest in others. And that as we do it, we know you said you would be with us even to the end of the age. We ask the Holy Spirit to give us insight how to share meals, how to share our friends and how to share a story and our own story, but to give us insight as to the life and teachings of Jesus, to give us courage. We pray for our nation. We pray that as our federal and state governments choose new leaders, that you would bless us with peace, that you would grant our current leaders and our next leaders wisdom that they may lead us in a way of peace and righteousness and justice. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I guess we're done. <laughs>